today's spotlight is on Rebecca Clark, Toronto Zookeeper. Hey, welcome to the show, Rebecca. How are you? I'm good. I'm very excited to be here. All right. So joining us today is a zookeeper, Rebecca Clark. She works at the famed Toronto Zoo. She's also an avid yogist. And we are thrilled to have her joining the show to talk about what's going on at the zoo and in her life. Thank you again for joining us, for coming on our humble podcast, Rebecca. <laughs> so before we move forward, I got to ask you, ask this of everybody, can you tell us something that if I went to Google right now and typed in Rebecca Clark Zookeeper, what would not show up? Anything. Um, probably that I don't have a TV. Um, so I really like learning new things. So most of my free time from not having a TV, I spend reading and taking different courses and uh, trying out different movement practices. So wow. yeah. I, I need to like, uh, yeah, get rid of my TVs because I, <laughs> I waste so much time. I, you know, my mother used to call it the idiot box. <laughs> she was so right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to actually start off with Dr. Robin, our resident veterinarian. She had a great question for you. Yes, hi. So what are you guys doing to protect the big in this, since we know that we've seen a lot of them coming down with COVID after being exposed to people who have Dr. Robin, could you repeat that one more time? We lost the beginning of it. Adrian? Sure. I was like, um, you know, what are you guys doing to protect the big cats during this pandemic? Um, since a lot of zoos have come down with positive the big cats, the minks um, that have come down after being exposed to people who have COVID. Great question. That is a great question. So um, at the Toronto Zoo, all of the staff have to be fully vaccinated and all of the visitors have to be fully vaccinated as well. So that is the first step that we're taking to protect our animals. Um, they've also put up uh, barriers so that there's no um, aerosolized particles that are, that are being able to reach the COVID susceptible animals. And we have protocols in place when working with those animals based on the severity of the risk. So, um, using N95 masks, wearing gloves. Um, yeah, so, so we are taking it seriously. Um, they keep adding new animals as COVID progresses. Um, so yeah, there's quite a few species that are actually on the list, um, but cats seem to be a big one. And in particular, snow, leopard, snow leopards seem to be getting hit pretty hard um, mm -hmm. with COVID. So this yeah. is a question for both you and uh, Dr. Robin, so are you seeing a lot of COVID cases, particularly with uh, cats and, and any other animals? Are you seeing a lot of those cases? We have not, luckily in this area. I mean, the animals, we've tested a few, and luckily all the animals we've tested have come back negative. Um, cats in general are susceptible to coronavirus, period. Like they have their own coronavirus. They're very susceptible to their own coronavirus. So we're not necessarily surprised to see cats being very high on the list of things if they were going to be any kind of cross that cats are there. And Rebecca, are you seeing a lot of cases or no? Uh, we actually haven't seen any cases at our zoo. Um, most of the information is coming from other zoos. Um, there's been a lot of stuff coming from the states, so um, yeah, uh, which isn't surprising. I was, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was Denver just um, had it in their hyena clan. Mm. I'm pretty sure it was Denver. So yeah, th there's been a bunch of different species that are getting it, and we are hoping to start vaccinating um, some of our animals um, as well. So the I I know in the states a bunch of the primate groups has been vaccinated against COVID. Mm. So mm. yeah, awesome. just trying to do our best to protect the animals in our care. That's awesome. There's one comment online from Rebecca Bell who says, uh, "quote throws out her TV." <laughs> 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 so you you already got the word out to at least one person. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, Ellen, what, did you have a question for, for Beck? Yeah, so this wouldn't be a question if you worked in a zoo in America, because the answer would be yes. But did you guys get any backlash over having vaccine requirements for visitors? Yes, we we, we did. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that that has been challenging. Um, mm -hmm. I think I think some of the other industries have had more backlash, though. I think once you start talking about how our animals are susceptible and they currently aren't able to be vaccinated, they can't wear masks, um, they can't wash right. their hands. I think when you express the risk, and that's one of the main motivators for this, I think people can see it a little bit better, but we still have had people that have been pretty upset by it. And you've been seeing that on our social media platforms and even uh, feedback that the zoo has been getting. So, yeah. That's crazy. Robbie? Um, one of the more interesting impacts that I've seen as far as the pandemic on animals is um, some social animals falling into depression because they're not interacting with the humans that they're used to seeing every day. So I'm just curious if you've seen anything like that at the, at the Toronto Zoo and what methods have you come up with to counter that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we, yeah, we've had, we've had stretches where we've been closed to the public because of COVID. And um, we definitely have some species that have been impacted by that. So any of the animals that tend to be highly social, um, the primates and the hyenas are two, two in particular that, that seem to miss having the visitors and the public. Um, yeah, so one of, one of the things that we've been doing to help with that is um, when the zoo was closed, they were having um, events where they were asking staff members to come up and hang out with the hyenas and uh, hang out with the hang out with the primates just so that they had people to interact with. Um, I think some of the animals have have liked the break and have liked the peace and quiet and we've definitely seen an increase in the uh, native wildlife. So there's been lots of deer running around site and lots of foxes. So that, that's been cool. But yeah, we've we've been trying to uh, keep them entertained and um, a bunch of our animals have TVs that they can that they can watch and <laughs> have, have some sort of visual stimulation. Yeah, <laughs> but we, we also um, give our animals enrichment and do training with them and uh, lots of stuff to, to keep them stimulated. Yeah, so you, you, uh, your other passion is yoga, right? Yes. So I, I was, uh, uh, I was, I heard that you are doing yoga at the zoo. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. I, um, so because of my industry and I'm sure Dr. Robin can attest to that as well. Um, c compassion fatigue is a big thing where yeah. you're, uh, working with other living mm -hmm. things and that can be really draining. We, uh, see hard things. Um, so yeah, I, I have been through a bunch of that at the zoo. So I felt it was very important to kind of teach to teach yoga to staff to help give them an outlet and to help find a way to to channel some of this emotion. So yeah, it's oh. it's mainly for staff, but I have done some other okay. um, events so at the zoo. You're doing it for staff. So you but you spoke about I'm interested now in what you're talking about compassion fatigue. So what what happens? Can you describe that. And I'll ask Robin um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think any job where you are providing care, um, it's it's really challenging be, because there's there's a lot of emotion that goes into it, and I think people pick these jobs because we do care and because we do want to make a difference. So. I think when when you're seeing hard things and dealing with hard things on a regular basis, animals dying, um, sick animals, when you're seeing the emotional impact that has on other people, mm. it, it can just be very heavy. Um, there's also traumatic stuff that happens. And if you are not finding a way to um, 
kind of kind of channel that then mm-hmm. it, it gets stored in in the body so like trauma trauma work is like another one of my passions okay. um so yeah i i i think it's important to find that release well i'm gonna get to robin in a second so trauma work is another one of your passions i need to know more <laughs> you keep saying these these words <laughs> I, I, now I need to know more what what trauma work what is that what so so I've uh, been playing around with, um, it's called TRE. So it's trauma release exercises. Mm. So um, emotions mm. get stored in the body as tension and trauma release work is kind of like a backdoor way to, um, instead of talking talking about the trauma, it's a way to allow the body to physically release that tension. So mm. it results in uh, shaking, which is what animals do um Mm. to get rid of trauma themselves so if you if you capture an animal and then let let it go it will sit there and shake as humans we've learned to suppress suppress this uh natural ability to release trauma so this is a cool way where we can look at animals and see how they're doing it effectively and ways that we can start to uh to get to get rid of this so we're not storing it and then having health problems down the road as a result of that i love that all right. That's amazing. Yeah, it's cool. I want to ask Dr. Robin about this compassion fatigue. Are you dealing with that as a veterinarian as well? Oh, yes. Um, the veterinary field has the highest suicide rate of any professional I didn't um, know that. In, in the world. And a lot of that is due to the fact that we deal with life and death on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. Um, and in such a way that you are, you know, at least in my, you know, my world, um, you're, you have a client, which is the human, and then you have your patient, which is the, the little four-legged, two-legged, winged, whatever, um, that comes in, and you are balancing the needs of your patient with the needs of your client and helping your mm-hmm. client through the grieving process, um, mm-hmm. helping your client deal with, um, you know, bad uh diagnosis and helping them make choices for their loved one who can't talk. And it is taking its toll on members of our profession um, so much. And like we said, we we, um, are battling a lot of depression. They're battling a lot of suicide. Um, And compassion fatigue is is a huge, a huge issue right now. And we're trying to find answers and try to find ways and it's really kind of cool to hear you know you're doing like the yoga with your um your uh, workmates to um help them deal with that that's really really cool um and really exciting to hear that you know we're trying to find ways to combat it so kudos thank you i can't imagine because rebecca dr robin actually um was my veterinarian and she was i had to put down you know one of my dogs, my favorite dog. I had the dog when I was like, in, you know, eight weeks in the level palm of my hand. And and I can't imagine, I mean, that was horrible for me, but, you know, with Dr. Robin being a friend, she knows me and then she's probably seeing me react. And then she, she knew the dog. And so, you know, I can't imagine what that, and that I hadn't, oh, yeah. I didn't know about the suicide being an issue. I didn't even, I've never even heard the term compassion fatigue um mm-hmm. this is like a this and I, I love what you're doing with the yoga that's that's fantastic mm-hmm. um online we have uh paulette bertrand says i'm surprised by this info first time i heard of this it makes sense though uh jose says yeah. holy i never would have thought of that a suicide being an issue um and she also says animals are also so vulnerable Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is, that is amazing. So I love what you're doing at the Toronto Zoo. It must be like the funnest job ever, though. I mean, I know you were talking compassion fatigue and <laughs> we're, we're talking like <laughs> all wow. these negative things, but it's got to be fun some days, too, right? Oh, it's amazing. It's I, I wouldn't trade it for anything like we we have such a variety. So I, I get to work with so many different species and I've I've got to work with a lot of things over the course of my career and got to got to participate in a lot of really cool 
opportunities. Um, so yeah, it's, it's the greatest. I get paid to go to work and have fun and share my passion with other people. So it doesn't get much mm -hmm. better than that. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. Well, we are out of time. Um, so I, I definitely want to thank you so much for joining us. Are there any last thank words, you. any last thoughts, any shout outs you want to give to anyone? Um, I just want to say that hyenas are the most amazing animals. And if you <laughs> don't know anything about them, then uh, look them up. They have lots of incredible, um, interesting tidbits about them. So, yeah. So do you care That's for hyenas? So, I used something to. I learned, yeah. Something I learned from Rebecca is that hyenas purr. Like cats, it's amazing. <laughs> Just this low rumble oh kind of God. purring thing. Are they from the dog family or are they from the cat family? They are kind of like a weird cat dog. They're they're not part <laughs> of either. But from a physiological perspective, they're more closely related to the cat. But my favorite my favorite tidbit about hyenas is that the females have pseudo penises, so they <laughs> look like they look like they have. Um, an actual penis and they get erections as well so oh, wow. <laughs> i'll just drop that it's unnecessary wait before I, before we go i gotta ask you what what is your favorite animal to care for um pro probably the hyenas the hyenas yeah. okay all right yeah who are you caring for now right if you're not doing hyenas now who, who's your animal your main animal now uh i work with birds of prey mainly just like eagles and hawks and all the good stuff. Yeah. Modern day dinosaurs. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's awesome. So, okay. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca, for joining us. Wow, this was a Thanks great. Thanks for having me. You know, and again, I'd love to have you back to talk some more. So, if you ever want to come back, you just let let us know. We'd love to have <laughs> you. So, all right. Thank you again, and we will talk to you soon. All right. See you.